Mark McCormick, TD Securities Global Head of FX Strategy, joining us now. Rates are starting to rise. The Chinese are warning about bubbles in U.S. assets. Uh, people are starting to wonder whether inflation is going to come roaring back. Mark, we are focused on the dollar. The dollar is kind of the story around which so much pivots. What is your take right now? The U.S. is starting to really pick up speed. The economy is gathering pace. What about the dollar? So, yeah, thanks. Uh, that, that's a great question because the dollar is kind of linking all of these themes that you're talking about because what, what we're basically seeing here is a transition from the 2020 liquidity trade, which saw every asset in the world essentially correlated, and we're seeing this to a, a transition to what people are calling, you know, U.S. exceptionalism 2.0. The dollar sits in the middle because what we've seen is that central banks have been able to repress term premium, repress real rates. And what they've done is they, they've anchored macro volatility, the VIX, the move, currency vol. They're all lower than they should be. And on the other side of that is where you talk about the, frac uh, the frothiness in equity markets. So some yield curves are too steep. Some equity markets are too expensive. Commodities are a little bit overdone. And the way that all of this gets flushed out is through a stronger dollar. And that's kind of what we're doing right now is transitioning from one theme to the, to the next one, which the markets are not positioned for and they're not prepared for at this moment, which is why we've seen so much two-way risk the last couple of weeks. Okay, so how does that shake out? Uh, I think it's an extension of what we've seen last week. Um, so basically, if you look at the, the framework that we're thinking through, real rates still need to be about 20, 25 basis points higher. Um, you still need to see about one standard deviation moves in the VIX and currency vol and, um, and the move. And so essentially what that does is it lends itself to a stronger dollar, uh, a broader dollar. So EM currencies are selling off, G10 selling off. But when this is over, we're blending these two narratives together of global reflation and U.S. exceptionalism because what's key to this, uh, this system that we're going through now is we are seeing rates sell off for good reason because global growth is coming back and the vaccines are helping deliver that. So, you know, while we transition, there's more volatility, but we'll be in a new state. Maybe it's in a month or maybe it's in six weeks, but we are going to be in a new environment that's not as correlated with the broad dollar. Mark, the broad dollar. So let's talk about the broad dollar and then try and break the broad dollar down into its component parts. Are we going to see the dollar underperforming some baskets and outperforming others? The eurozone certainly pushing back. The ECB's making no secret about the fact that it doesn't want to see rates rise. But then you look at the commodity currencies uh, and then you look at the Chinese currency uh, and what is happening there, potentially preparing to open up the current account. How specific do you need to be in terms of your dollar strength, dollar weakness theme? I think that's absolutely critical because last year in the 2020 liquidity trade is dollar up, dollar down. It's all one big thing. I think what we're moving into is something that's really basically back to macroeconomic fundamentals, regional growth divergences, central bank policy normalization. It's all the stuff that people love about macroeconomics where you can look at these factors across countries and see which one's doing better. And I think in that environment, you get a mixed dollar. So what you see is a lot of variation on the broad dollar. And your baskets really come back to what factors in the market are making money and which ones are performing well. And what we've seen on our factors that, tra uh, that track the thematic themes across currency markets is yield curve steepness is important. Commodity sensitivity is important. Economic growth divergence is important. And carry is important. So after this washout, which would, again, drive the broad dollar higher, that would create an environment where the correlations start to break down again. But in that environment, you want to look for selective EM currencies that have good growth, that are linked to commodity cycle, that have cheap valuations. Um, and then on the G10, as you mentioned, uh, to me, this is a pivot from a dollar funding market to a euro funding market. Because on all of these forward-looking indicators, steepness of the yield curve, growth expectation, vaccine deployment, the vaccine campaigns, the eurozone is lagging the U.S., notwithstanding the fact that the U.S. is delivering a $1.8 trillion stimulus package with potentially $3 trillion in infrastructure, by the end of this year, and there's just no growth impulse coming from the Eurozone that will be able to keep up with that. So uh, that's that's the setup for the next month and probably the next three to six months after that. There's a lot to unpack there uh, for a sec. Let's start with the Euro. So what's the downside for the Euro? Um, Deutsche Bank was talking about how there is catch-up potential uh, for the U.S. and Europe when it comes to vaccinations versus the U.K., because the people who are vaccinated here have two doses most likely versus just that one shot in the UK. So I'm wondering if there is that catch-up potential in the smaller term over the next few months. 
Yeah, I'd say the euro in those three currencies, the catch-up trade on vaccines really through euro sterling. Um, that one has been, I think, a very you know surprised one. So if you look at like growth expectations, they're much lower in the UK as a starting point versus where they are in the eurozone. And if you look at mobility, we are seeing some like greater pickup in the UK and mobility because the vaccines essentially breaking those links. I think when you think about those two things against the dollar, I think both of them still have uh, some room to move lower. So on cable, you're thinking you know maybe a move to 135. Um, especially on the repricing of central banks. You know, again, what we're pricing out from the Bank of England is the potential to be negative. What we're pricing in on the Fed side is an adjustment in real rates higher um, and essentially, you know, earlier tapering. And obviously, markets have pulled rate hike expectations forward from 2024 to some point in 23. So again, for, for that complex, it's still dollar positive. But the way you trade is really through euro sterling, uh, potentially edging a little bit higher as we reach the bottoms there for, the, for that pair. Mark, can I just wrap things up kind of where we started, which is a little focus on China. Um, there's some interesting articles being written at the moment, interesting research talking about we're getting to the stage where maybe the Chinese do unlock uh, their current accounts. They start, they've, they've got to the point basically where there is an equal amount of foreign money looking to invest in China and Chinese money to invest in, in foreign assets. How big a shift could that be in terms of your world, global FX, if the Chinese were to do that, to allow the currency to have a little bit more latitude? Yeah, and that, that plays into the reserve diversification story. And so, you know, part of what we saw through 2020, I think, is absolutely critical, is that, you know, there was a huge divergence between the manufacturing sector and the service sector. And Asia dominated that cycle because it's a manufacturing economy and everyone was basically ramping up demand for uh, manufacturing, while services in, in Western developed markets basically compressed. Um, so what you saw is widening trade surpluses, a widening trade deficit in the U.S. Those trade surpluses saw Asian central banks recycle back into the euro. If we start to see the narrowing of that gap, and we think over time, what's the next thing, that, big thing that could happen in currencies, if China does open itself up on, on the capital market side, then you know essentially what they're saying is we're willing to run a current account deficit but essentially, we can off offset that through a broad balance of payment surplus because we're receiving fixed income and equity flows. And that's that's where they've been going. Um, if you think about how they've connected to the Lung and Stock Exchange and how they've been connected with uh, broader MSCI indicators. So China's you know role as a reserve currency is obviously rising. So what it does is it does create more competition for the euro and the dollar as a third store of value, which uh, I think is a longer-term trend that's really just going to accelerate um, in the years ahead.